Hi, I'm Janine. This is Outside the Box. And standing by to join me is very special guest, Sanford Greenberg, who I'm going to refer to as Sandy, by the way. And he's the author of the new memoir, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, How Daring Dreams and Unyielding Friendship Turn One Man's Blindness into an Extraordinary Vision for Life. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Janine. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I thought you would be wonderful on this series, this new series, Outside the Box, because you've had an extraordinary path of different, different things in your life. Um, could you give a little backstory into uh, how you got to where you are now? I know that's kind of a long story, but perhaps, <laughs> you know, what interests you as a child and then going to Columbia? Well, that's a very interesting question. I'll try and do it in summary fashion. Okay. Uh, uh, last week I described to you my early, early childhood, and uh, we lived in a uh, poor section of Buffalo, New York, but fortunately I had a mother and a grandmother and two fathers because the first one died, and it was a very lean time. And what I recall most is because the four people I mentioned were basically working somehow in one way or another just to survive, to sustain us. And so they didn't have much time for me. I was alone most of the time. And while that may seem uh, sad, to have a little boy yes. alone. Uh, on the contrary, it's when I began dreaming. Wow. Uh, I, I dreamt about all sorts of things and what I could do, what I wanted to do, but they were, they were just dreams. But they occupied me much of the time, and in an ironic way, as you know, I went blind in my junior year at Columbia University. And mm. after I went blind, I found myself in a similar situation to when I was a young boy. And that is to say, I lived much of my life, I do live much of my life, inside my head, where a mind where thoughts assemble, and proliferate. And here's the key, undisturbed by any visual images. Mm. Yes. There, there is my mind, and then beyond that, the entire universe. So I am able to dream in a way that is similar to the way I dreamed when I was a little boy, but also quite different because the question is, when I dream and when I think about all the limitless things that are possible to be done by a human being, I have then to question how do you implement those dreams? How do you bring them into reality? And I've spent much of my life bringing my dreams into reality. Well, it's interesting that part of your book title, How Daring Dreams and Unyielding Friendship Turn One Man's blindness and extraordinary vision. Do you feel like you've always had these daring dreams? Yes, in a word. Mm -hmm. Even as a little boy, I would dream about living in a much better place, a much more beautiful place. And uh, that, of course, was fantasy, but it sustained me on a daily basis. It was my own private world and I shared it with no one. Wow. It became a, a place of solace for you, probably, to have those dreams. Yes, it did. It, it, it surely was. But I should also say that my mother and grandmother and both of my fathers provided not only solace, but great inspiration for me because... They worked so hard. For example, my second father, Carl, was a junk dealer. Not a particularly glamorous business. 
but it enabled us when my mother remarried to move to a much better section of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And he worked in the junk shop at that time, seven days a week. And if you can imagine, you went to Syracuse, so you understand how the Buffalo cold oh. in the dead of, dead of winter. Is 40 below clean. wind chill. Yes. <laughs> and he, and he, he worked outside with no heat. Oh. And during the summer, he worked in the sweltering heat with no air conditioning. And he never had time to give me advice or sermons or anything. And I am pleased that that's the case because what he imparted to me was from the way in which he led his life, which was he had a duty to go and support a family. He did it unflinchingly. It was brutish to be doing what he was doing. And yet he never complained, never, not once. And so that's, that's a pretty, pretty good lesson to learn. Yes, a bit of a role model. Yes, and you would think that would not be the case. Right. But as you also know, David Rockefeller was a role model of mine. And uh, he, in a way, David, substituted when I met him, which was after my uh, second father passed away. Okay. He stood in as a substitute father, and that lasted uh, oh. 60-some years until he died a couple of years ago at 101. Mm. What a relationship. It, it was wonderful. It, it always puzzled me because at the time I first met him in the 60s, he was literally the richest man in the world. And what I never understood and still don't, is why he took me under his wing. I had nothing to offer him. I was probably at that time the poorest kid in the world, uh, and if not the poorest, pretty close to it. And he guided me. He introduced me to people. We talked philosophy. We talked philanthropy. We talked politics. Uh, and uh, it, it was as well in later years as business. And it took me years to begin a more formal business relationship with him and the Chase Manhattan Bank. Sure. But in all respects, he was a stellar role model, and so was my father, Carl, the junk dealer. What a blessing. You bet. That's why I consider myself the luckiest man in the world, because I have had countless blessings heaped upon me every day of my life. It sounds like those relationships really shaped you for who you would become as a man. Yes, that's an excellent insight and 100% correct. I absorbed the values that these men had that is not to gainsay the importance of my grandmother and mother, whose values I also absorbed. That's amazing. I feel that those experiences that you had growing up probably led you to want to maybe help other people, maybe mentor other people. I know we were talking earlier, and this is an extraordinary time where we have over 40 million people out of work. Mm. And for anybody listening, take the time to somebody who reaches out to you on LinkedIn or wherever who's a student who wants a little guidance because perhaps they lost that summer job or they don't have that internship opportunity. Wow. What a, <clears throat> what a moving statement to have compassion for those 40 million people. We it, must. It, it's true. And it's frankly for me very difficult to live knowing that fact. Right. Uh, not only because of their, but for the grace of God, go I. But just, I can only imagine the human suffering that exists in that number, 40 million. I was blown away myself. I had someone on, uh, Chris Farrell from N NPR, and mm -hmm. he shared with me, we were talking about uh, the economy, and I've had people from UCI, UC Irvine, uh, here in Orange County, and I was blown away. I, this was over a month ago, and I couldn't believe that number. And then you think about 
the people that can't make their rent payments, they don't know, they have children, they don't know, you know, where they're going to go next, but they know they're going to be booted out. You know, and there's, there's this mental health issue right now for so mm-hmm. many people of all different ages. Yes, it's, it's a true tragedy in the classic sense of that word. Yes. So let me ask you this, though, because when you went blind, you wanted to throw in the towel, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I did. And what happened? Well, the day of my surgery, when the doctor told me the day before, he, after examining me, he said, and I've mentioned this to you in the past, he said, well, son, you're going to be blind tomorrow. Uh. And it was true. It was tomorrow. And what was the terrible pain that existed in that room? From my perspective, it was not the pain in my eyes, although there was that, but the pain that must have existed in my mother's heart, having seen her eldest son go blind, his eyes cut open. That has been a, a terrible thing to think about. And so I spent a lot of the rest of my life trying to make her proud of me and my other ancestors. So that was your goal after you went blind to make your mom proud of you? No, it was it was one of the goals for okay. sure. But the the other see the way I came to view the world was looking at me from the perspective of a person who lives in the United States and walks in freedom. That is me. Mm -hmm. And while I was young, other members of my family perished in Europe in circumstances that were quite the opposite of free. And that is why I live under an unspoken, unwritten mandate to reciprocate that gift of freedom by doing everything I can to serve the common good. That's wonderful. I want to just share a little bit about your credentials, your your background with the listeners. We're speaking with Sanford Greenberg, chairman of the board of governors of the John Hopkins University's Wilmer I Institute, the largest clinical and research enterprise in ophthalmology in the United States. You're also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, as well as a trustee emeritus of the John Hopkins University and John Hopkins Medicine, which incorporates the School of Medicine and the hospital. And there are numerous other accolades as well. Do you want to just give a glimpse into what you're doing now? I'd be happy to. This relates back to that time when I went blind in Detroit, Michigan in 1961, when I described the pain that was in that small room my mother and I existed in. It was close to unbearable. And at that moment, the lowest moment in my life, I promised God that I would do everything I could for the rest of my life, to make sure that no one, no one should go blind. And that is one of the mandates under which I live. And it took decades for me to arrive at a point where I felt science, the vision sciences, the neurosciences, were at a point in the early part of this century where we could try and bring together the most brilliant minds of this generation to focus on a simple concept, end blindness. In 2012, Sue and I created a prize, $3 million, to be, get, to be given to the individual or team of researchers that has done the most to end blindness across the globe for everyone and forevermore. Because you see, when you step back 
and you think about it, blindness is our oldest cruelty. We have been afflicted by it for more than six million years. It's a subversion of the creator's intent, as I see it, and certainly an injustice that can no longer be tolerated by our society. And when we succeed, and we will, all of God's children will not only feel the sunshine on their faces, but will witness with their own two eyes its rising and its setting. And then, and only then, will creation be made whole. You are one driven man on a mission. I admire you. Thank you. We didn't touch on something, and that is your relationship with your college friend who helped you. Yes, Art Garfunkel, as he is known to the world today. Uh, Before I talk about Arthur, who was certainly an important, crucial part of my life, I have to first state that my wife, who was in sixth grade, someone I fell in love with really hard. Really? Sixth grade? Sixth grade. (laughs) That's adorable. I, I walked into the classroom and I saw this stunningly beautiful young girl. And then for a moment, for me, the earth stood still. I could not get her out of my mind. I followed her in the hallways, followed her when she rode her bike, followed her when she was talking with her friends, but I could not speak to her. Too shy? Nat- Were you too yes. shy? Oh, okay. Yes. And naturally, as a result, she never spoke to me. Right. Uh, but, you know, I ask myself and am haunted by this question, might I have been able to survive the ordeal of blindness without the presence of Sue, physically Mm -hmm. at times, but spiritually at all times? And the answer is absolutely not. Ever since I fell in love with her, one spark on one unforgettable day, I ask, would my life have remained such a joy, such a joy to live, that, Janine, I cannot imagine. Oh, I can't stop smiling. Why is that? It's a beautiful story. Yes, it's 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 my it's my life. A blessing. A blessing. Understanding. Speaking of my college roommate. Arthur, we met in 1958 as freshmen at Columbia, and we became very close over a very short period of time. And one day, after humanities class, we walked outside, and he called me over to look at a patch of grass. He said, Sanford, look at that grass. Really look at it. And as I was, he pointed out how light illuminated the beauty and complexities of its colors. At that moment, I knew something of great importance was being given to me. Mm. but But I had no idea how great it really was and was going to be. We became roommates. And... We were joined by another close friend, Jerry Spire, with whom we stay in constant contact with. That is to say, the three of us, Arthur and Jerry and myself. Arthur and I made a pact at the end of our freshman year. When we roomed together, we would live under an understanding that if one of us was in crisis, the other would come to his aid. And when we made that, I was fully sighted 
and had no idea of what was going to come. The gods had not yet thrown me down. Wow. Then, after my our sophomore year, where we had truly uh, joyous times, at night we would sing together. He'd play the guitar. I'd play the drums. I was the DJ. And uh, we recorded it. And for his 60th birthday, I presented him with a recording that of all that music and praying that we did in our college dormitory room. Mm. But then when I went blind, after leaving Detroit, I went back to Buffalo, my hometown, where, as you pointed out, I was in quite a... Depressed state. Large, yes, yeah. I guess I guess that's... In those days, we didn't think of depression, but... Uh, it was certainly despondency or despair, whatever word you'd like to use. I was inert. I was like a mollusk. I just laid there. There was no future for me because I considered the following set of facts as a person interested in the empirical uh, nature of the world. I was a dropout, no longer attending Columbia. I was blind, I had no future, and I had no money. Now, why why Sue stayed with me, as I said before, I, I'll, I'll never really know. And why Arthur did what he did for me after that event is still to this day unimaginable because he gave him his life, the life that he was living, he divorced himself from it, altered his own ways to better conform to mine. He would take me around the city, take me to class, fix my tape recorder. Most important, though, he would read to me regularly. He would say, Sanford, darkness is going to read to you from the Iliad, hmm. or San Sanford, darkness is going to read to you today. And I, I suppose he meant that for me, his voice was emerging from the darkness. Yes. And in a, in a way that that foreshadowed the title of this book, it had absolutely no connection with the song Simon and Garfunkel sang five years later. But the importance of Arthur in my life at this most crucial time cannot be understated. The ultimate act of kindness and compassion, right there. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Oh. It's extraordinary what you went on to do with your life, but you, it sounds like between Sue and you know Arthur, I, yeah. the love and dedication of your friends and family was extraordinary. Yes, it was. That, that's why I'm here today. Those two people in the first instance tore me away from the horrific wilderness of blindness that I was living in. And when I was back in Buffalo, Arthur flew in and saw me in this state of despondency and said, Sanford, you must return to Columbia. And I said, Arthur, there is no chance in hell that I'm going to return. Take a look at me. I'm blind. I'm finished. I am ruined. And he said nothing to that. So we took a walk down my street mm -hmm. and we bantered for a while. It was almost as though we were walking back on college campus and enjoying the life we had enjoyed there. But then he said, Sanford, despite your circumstances, you must come back. Now, it's not that you have to come back for yourself. Though you do, I need you there. And you remember, Sanford, that we had a solemn pact that if one was in crisis, the other would come to his rescue. Well, I'm here to help you if you decide to return. 
but I need you there. So we would both be living up to our solemn commitment. Yes. Amazing. What a bond. Yes, ma'am. What a bond. To, to this day. Now, I'm going to pivot for a second because I want to see if you could share some advice to people that want to maybe pivot and do something new and different, but they're struggling, whether they have a health issue, whether they are out of work, something. I feel like with what you have gone through, perhaps you could share a little advice of resiliency. You're kind to think that. I certainly have no real answers. My experience is my own. And so this is the story of one person's life. Uh, I myself realized near the outset of my, the onset of my blindness, that Marcus Aurelius, the great Roman emperor, who was also a brilliant philosopher, said, after describing the human frailties and vanities, he said, what then can escort a man through life? And he answered, philosophy. Hmm. Now, you may call it philosophy or he may call it philosophy. Another word for that is attitude. And I came to appreciate the fact that even the bad things are good. Because even the bad things are a source of remembrance, a flavor of this life. Life is very precious. Our lives, how we live them. You can't get it anyplace else. And when it's gone, it's gone. For example, when I was alone in that hospital room in Detroit, despite the misery that existed in that room, there was also a sweet patina that covered it because how many times in life does a child have to exist solely with one's mother for such an intense period of time? Mm -hmm. And while we did not speak to each other, because I certainly couldn't say anything to comfort her, nor could she say anything to comfort me, there was and perhaps it's mystical, but it stays with me, has stayed with me all of these years. So yes, while it was a bad thing, but there was also something good about it. A time that I will always treasure, simply being there with the love of a mother for a son and a son for a mother, hanging in the balance. You are saying, what advice can I give somebody? Well, if you start with that attitude, if you can really believe it, because it is true. And actually, let me give you an example. Yes. That's outside of me. Beethoven, at age 28, wrote a letter to his two brothers in which he said, a man was standing next to me and he could hear the flutist playing several yards away from us, but I could not. That drove me mad, and I wanted to end my life. And then he said, but I still have to give forth the art that is in with me to the world. And so... I endured this wretched existence, truly wretched. So even if you are an extremist, you have the music of your life to give to the world. And that is a contribution to humanity. So you can live in extremely different circumstances but you also can contribute something to society. Another 
way of looking at the question you pose would be and without being self-serving um, because this is an important question for all of us in the world today would be to read my book hello darkness my old friend because in it i guess i say one of the most important things or pieces of advice i would give somebody in my case i chose life justice ginsburg in her foreword to hello darkness my old friend wrote quote he chose life in all its vibrancy close quote the vibrancy of life is what i was just talking about for the last few minutes that is a gift that is given to us a gift that must be treasured and one of the reasons i wrote the book is because i believe that if you are given this extraordinary gift you ought to make an accounting for it and i believe the accounting should be in writing because the written word forces precision both in writing and of course in thought and so to a very great extent by my completing hello darkness i feel that i have made my accounting to the almighty you you sure have that's beautiful i'm glad you shared that thank you i feel like your book is very timely right now considering so many people are going through so many different levels of you know anxiety and uh obviously depression and we talked about people being out of work losing their jobs working remotely having to juggle things at home there's a lot going on so i think there's a lot of lessons in your book well thank you for saying that i hope that each person who reads the book will find something of value in it for themselves is there anything else you would like to highlight in your book for listeners no i think what i said before still remains true from my perspective mhm the thing i want to highlight which i have talked about and talked about is to really understand how precious this thing is when i was 30 years old i went to see my doctor and i asked him that if i was given a diagnosis of terminal cancer i would like you to help me end my life and he said i will be happy to do that for you but let me tell you i have many patients and have had many patients who are confronted with the same dilemma and they cling to life harder than anyone else a statement of how precious this gift is yeah sorry i had a moment of thinking back i had a heavy sigh after that statement because my dad had stage 4 colon cancer oh my god Oh, yeah, it was it was an oh my god and he could not understand how they could not get rid of it but mm. at that point it, you know there was nothing that could be done and i just remember capturing a picture of the two of us together when he got that last diagnosis from a doctor in florida and him just feeling so helpful helpless and wanting to cling to life and not wanting to let go but that's how some people live their lives that was my dad he had like nine lives so many you know <laughs> and I, and i admire that so many different businesses and interests and i that's how i feel i live well you sure have proved that to me given what i know about you and now that i've met you it's been a great pleasure thank you that's a high compliment coming from you it's coming from a regular guy from buffalo humble who, <laughs> well i don't i don't know about that but that's that's my story what you read in the book is uh, everything i think i can say to well it, it was not written as a how to guide or something to be helpful with it was written because of the reasons i told you and i'm pleased that you have taken time last week and this week to highlight it that is very very uh, good of you like i said earlier There's a very important message also for me coming out of the book that does relate to what we're going through that if you see someone struggling just like Art saw you struggling and so yes. there for you reach out to them because there's nothing worse than somebody going it alone 
feeling isolated, yes. feeling, feeling lost and no direction. But when somebody takes the time and the energy and commits to pulling you out of that dark place, it's amazing. It's a life changer. That's the most important statement of this past hour or so. Mm-hmm. That, that was really, really important. And I think if even a small number of people adhere to that advice, it would be making a contribution to our culture and our civilization. You bet. Where can people find out more about you? SanfordGreenberg.com. Anywhere else they can, can they send an email to you if they have a question or anything? If they send it to the, uh, my email, I guess you could send it to hello darkness, the book.com. Perfect. Then I will, I will get the message. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. You know, I enjoyed talking to you on my other show on KUCI, but this is, this was fantastic. Well, it was fantastic for me to meet someone who has an obvious joie de vivre that is infectious and has kept me most interested in learning about you and your show. So thank you for giving me that privilege. Thank you so much, Sandy. Take care.